In this episode of Futures in Biotech, we have a convergence of two science podcasts, a veritable science mashup, Futures in Biotech and This Week in Virology, coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, Episode 78, TWIV Infects Fib. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was not going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there the AD extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans, that would equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having other therapies? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that are rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun's the center of the universe, so this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Welcome to Futures in Biotech. Today, we're going to do an experiment. I guess as scientists, we are always compelled to, you know, try to do something different. And uh, this, this is going to be what, what I call a psi mashup. So we're going to do a podcast within a podcast and um, we'll see if they coexist. And uh, we think the audiences are, are, are fairly similar in, in the feedback that we're getting. And um, these guys... Uh, do a podcast that I like to listen to. It's really fun. One, they're very experienced um, in their field. Uh, two, they're great communicators. And three, fantastic public uh, production quality on their shows. So I appreciate all three. And that um, makes it really a great way to spend time when you're doing cell culture, when you're in the lab working. Uh, these, uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce the cast of This Week in Virology. And uh, first, let's uh, introduce the, um, the, the producer, um, Vincent Ragnallo. Hi, Vincent. Hey, Mark. This is visit number 11 on <laughs> FIB. Really? Has it been 11? It's amazing, amazing. isn't it? More than you. Yeah, so uh, Vincent's been co-hosting uh, a lot of shows on Futures and Biotech because he's a, a, one of our subject matter experts and, uh, you know, uh, a great podcaster. So he's, we've relied on him for a lot of great uh, interviewing. And so today he's kind of on both sides. He's being the guest and the host. Uh, very meta. I'm just very confused. <laughs> but hey, so the stories that we're going to talk about today, I, I'm, I'm going to do a little preface here, are, are very much related to some of the stories that uh, uh, are relevant to the shows that have been, been uh, on recent topics on Futures of Biotech. So, uh, Vincent, perhaps you could introduce uh, your cast. It would be really great to... Uh... Well, I'd be happy to. And, but first, let me say that this is This Week in Virology, episode number 125, recorded March 18th, 2011, and I'm Vincent Racaniello, as you heard, sitting behind me here with his arms folded, is Dixon de Palmier. Hey, Dixon. Hey, Vince. Dixon's at verticalfarm.com. Good to see you. Good to be seen. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts is Alan Dove. Good to be here. Hey, Alan. There he hey. is. And there I am on camera. Yeah, with the wood on the ceiling. How are you? Yes, yes. I'm going to get rid of those beams at some point, I suppose. <laughs> Do, doing okay. Uh, no, more, no more ice accumulating here, so that's a good sign. Yeah. Spring is on the way. Yes, course, so they say. Uh, where our, our third host is, our fourth host is Rich Condit. It's always spring. He's in north central Florida. Hey, Rich. Hi, fellas. How you doing? <clears throat> We're good. Doing great. Very well. Yeah, 80, crew. 84 degrees, clear blue skies. <laughs> That's right. Rich also works for the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> so today we have uh, the usual twiv, Mark. You want to just begin? Sure, let's go for it. All right, so we have two stories which we thought would be cool to talk about. The first one is called, it's a Science Express paper, it's called A Virophage at the Origin of Large DNA Transposons. And, that title yeah, is and I just want to say that if people thought that the show was meta in the introduction, it's going to get a whole lot worse. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it is. 
By the so, way, before before we do go, I'm I'm just trying to uh, piece together here uh, who's who's who, um, and and for the audience and the but um, Richard uh, Condit, you did your PhD at Yale, right? That's uh, correct. Uh, in the early 70s, a you long with, time ago, <laughs> with Joan Stites. That's correct. And so you were two labs down before I did my postdoc in 2002. So we crossed paths, but not. And the fourth dimension, right? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, were you were you in the basement of the Sterling Hall of Medicine? I think Joan had no. maybe moved by two thousand two. Right. She moved. She was at the Boyer Center, so it's okay. kind of meta. So the Boyer Center yeah. didn't exist. It was a parking lot when I was there. <laughs> um, but uh, so yeah, I was in the basement of the uh, Sterling Hall of Medicine. I was actually her first graduate student. Fantastic. Well, that's the amazing. first one. The first one in, not the first one out. Okay, so it depends on how you want to define Oh, that's right. That's at least amazing. you got out. Well, you yeah, probably should about also Yale's know meeting, about, right? you should know about Alan Dove, who was a, he is currently a science writer residing in Western Massachusetts, but he was my PhD student uh, in the early 90s, right, Alan? Yes, indeed I was, and, I, and it was very nice of you to, to only specify the early 90s. <laughs> you guys you still talk, the late 90s it, it, it actually extended that's a little bit past the yeah but yeah early 90s that's right wow and 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 uh, dixon you uh you you're on to a really really interesting project uh and maybe you could just give us a, a brief uh summary uh, on it and and sure. and i i'd like people to go take a listen to uh the episode where uh, vincent and dixon came on uh Vincent co-hosted, but Dixon was the actual guest, and he talked about this project. Maybe just briefly, and then we'll go on to the paper. We'll sure. I mean, it's it. just about, uh, with urbanization, the way it's occurring nowadays, and with uh, the loss of land due to all kinds of reasons, climate change, uh, overpopulation, natural disasters, etc., uh, it occurred to our class 11 years ago to look at other ways of growing food, and, and one of the ways that they picked up on was to grow it on the rooftops. And it didn't turn out to be very successful at that point. I said, well, why don't we just move the idea inside and grow it inside buildings uh, using whatever technologies were available then. But since then, much greater, more powerful technologies have arisen, particularly with regards to making LED lighting much more efficient and much cheaper. So that's the idea is to make, you know, vertical food, vertical farming inside the city fresh on-demand food when, whenever you want it. So that's basically the idea. Uh, it has gain traction and uh, indeed there are some real projects out there now and one of them might actually come to fruition over the next year and a half in uh, Milwaukee. So we're very proud of the fact that an idea from class actually escaped into the real world. It's in Milwaukee? Yeah. Will Allen, uh, in charge of a group called Growing Power, uh, has uh, plans and has uh, started to raise funds for establishing a five-story vertical farm um, in the middle of Milwaukee and got permission from the city to do it. So it looks like it's going to happen. And, could you and by the way, I have a virology contract, uh, a context to put myself into also. I got my degree at uh, the University of Notre Dame um, working on germ-free animals, but I every Saturday I sat around a table uh, at which was Morris Pollard, who was, of course, the chairman of microbiology at that time, and uh, a first-class virologist who did most of his work on psittacosis and rabies. And uh, around that table were all of his students, and I was the only uh, non-virologist. So by osmosis, I picked up a lot of stuff, which I'm <laughs> now spewing out on TWIV as the... Because, gee, I heard about this first back in, you know, 1963 or 64, you know, places like that. And so I, I've had some very nice contacts with virologists most of my adult life as a uh, parasitologist. So I feel at home here. Well, it's too bad but we don't have the recordings of those conversations. Because those would have been yeah. nice podcasts. Oh, you, right. you know what? That, right. they, they were fantastic because they, they sounded just like our show. Because Morris was a very conversant person and very casual, but he... <laughs> You, you had to have performed in the lab that week in order to have something to say. Otherwise, they'd just pass over you. And uh, so it, it, everyone made sure to, to, to do their work during the week so they'd have something to say on Saturday. They would have had to record those like on a wax cylinder or something. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. A cat whisker with a... Uh... <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't have the modern technologies that we have today. But it was a lot of fun and very informative. Dixon was um, my initiator of TWIV. Uh, three yeah. 
three years ago now. That's right. I was your straight man. So I said, straight. who can I get to do this with me? And <laughs> Dixon came to mind. So he started it with I've, me. I've had so much uh, fun, and I've learned a great deal just by sitting here. There'll be a test next week. <laughs> <laughs> so your your listeners are getting a, um, your listeners are getting uh, you know, an Ivy League education here. Uh, and yeah. get to participate in discussions, not only at the level of the undergrad listening to the topics, but getting the insight um, in, in a more uh, informal way. And if they can, you know, reach out to you and like they do uh, with emails, they can converse with you and participate in the discussion. So it's, it's really amazing. So but right before we go, um, I just wanted to show this picture, which is a picture of uh, Dixon in, in front of uh, a... Uh, prototype <laughs> vertical farm here, and if I was in Milwaukee and one of this one of these was on Lake Michigan, I would really appreciate the fresh vegetables out of season. And uh, I think it, you know every city could really benefit from uh, from incredible quality uh, and and great use of resources here. I think it'd be just a lot oh, of fun. Thanks for the plug, Mark. All right, <laughs> all right. So uh, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, Vincent. Um, no problem. Yeah, this no is really, really fun. You guys are great, so you, you should celebrate the, uh, the interesting chemistry that you guys have. Well, I should uh -huh. say that uh, Alan was the second to join us. I thought it would be good to have a science writer, and that's what Alan is, has a different perspective. Of course, he has a broad uh, view of science as well as virology, so he has a different voice that he brings to the equation. And then a bit later, we brought in Rich Condit, who he got it from day one. He was a guest. And he really got it, and I thought, this is a guy we have to have on the show. Absolutely. So that's where we are at four, and occasionally we have some, some guests come in. But uh, it's mainly the four of us. It's awesome. So uh, I recommend that people who listen to Futures in Biotech, they, uh, you know, they send their RSS feed, uh, uh, RSS, uh, what do you call it, uh, aggregators or whatever. iTunes. <laughs> Just subscribe. Subscribe to Twit. <laughs> I do. It's a lot of fun. Um, and it was so much. Oh, so we should give them an actual episode Twitter. now. I think so. Yes, we could. Be good. We could do that. Right. So, so let's, let's start by that talking that paper. viruses that parasitize viruses that parasitize other microorganisms, right? <laughs> it's getting meta. Well, I, I think this is appropriate since it's a podcast within a podcast. That's yes, right. It's exactly. a, good, a good podcast point. phage or something like that, right? So this is a virus of a virus. It is uh, it's been given the name virophage, and what it is, it it, it begins with. A very large virus. So those of you who have listened to TWIV remember the Mimi viruses, which are the largest known viruses, have a genome of double-stranded DNA over a million base pairs in length with over a thousand open reading frames or possible protein coding regions. And these are typically viruses that infect amoeba. In this paper, we're dealing with a similar virus. It's called the Cafeteria renbergensis virus. So Cafeteria renbergensis is a flagellated phagotropic protozoan. And it's called Cafeteria because it eats all kinds of stuff in the water. Good and, and they bad. found, that, sorry? Good and bad cafeteria. Well, they <laughs> eat uh, mostly bacteria, I believe which is what you get in cafeterias. <laughs> That's right. Another name they could have picked is Schmorgerborg, Schmor, Schmor, ah, forget it. Right. Schmorgersborgensis. That's right. right. So this cafeteria renbergensis virus turns out to have a very small virus associated with it. So they look at infected cells, and they can see these tiny particles, which they call... My, ma virus, M A V I R U S, which stands for Maverick virus, and we'll, we'll explain why that is in a moment. But this Maverick virus is much smaller in size, and its genome is also smaller. And it will only replicate in cells that are already infected with the Cafeteria renbergensis virus. Hmm. Not only it needs the Cafeteria virus to replicate, it replicates within the actual places in the cell where the cafeteria virus is growing. These are called factories. And this little virus, May virus, replicates in those factories. And on top of everything, it inhibits the replication of the big virus. So it's an actual parasite. It requires the large virus and it, it affects it negatively. Would you call that a parasite, Dixon? I would. But uh, I have well, to know something we should, else. We should though, point Vince. out that these, when you say the the large virus, these are these are um, uh, 
the, the cafeteria virus is like the Mimi virus. It's one of these ginormous viruses. It's not just sure. a little on the heavy side. Right. 750,000 base pairs, right? Right. So a bit smaller than the Mimi, which is 1.2 million, but a respectable size. Right. Still yes, three, times, three times or so larger than what we have in the past thought of as the largest DNA containing viruses. And just for, just for the listeners, I have a, a pretty common uh, thumbnail calculation that I do where I figure that uh, uh, one kilobase of DNA is enough to encode about one gene. So 750 uh, kilobases is about 750 genes. And the Ma virus is 20 kilobases. So that's about 20 genes, a lot smaller, uh, kind of a medium to small size virus as they go. All right. Do most when viruses that I had this double genes, earlier, by the way, like where the, the DNA can, on one direction gives one gene and the DNA, the same DNA in a different direction gives another gene? Yeah, that happens. You have coding regions on both strands, sure. Especially not in very the smaller frequently. Ones. Oh, well, coding genes on both strands, but not necessarily completely overlapping. That's kind uh, of in, like in, a Scrabble, if somebody's trying to imagine this. DNA <laughs> can work as Scrabble where you have one word going one way and then another word starting halfway up going the other way or... Sure. I, I, when Vince and I had this conversation earlier this week, I asked him what the difference between this situation was compared to what I already knew about helper viruses, like SV40 and things of that sort. Well, that's a good question. So there are some known viruses that require a helper right. in which they can replicate. And a good example are the so-called adeno-associated viruses. Mm -hmm. They are small DNA viruses. They need to be in a cell co-infected with adenovirus. Right. There was also hepatitis delta, which requires hepatitis B to provide a capsid. So that's a helper virus. Now, why this is different is because this little May virus actually inhibits yeah, that's the big one. Exactly. So that's a non-helper. Right. Or a, uh, <laughs> it's a cure for the infection. Does it cure the infection of the big virus? I think it, well, it decreases doesn't cure it, it, but it, it inhibits the, the replication of it significantly. And, and the other question is, does the Ma virus replicate on its own, or does it actually need the larger no. virus? Right. No, it, does it needs not. the big guy. So right. from one standpoint, there is a helper virus. The bigger virus is the helper virus for the little one. And the little one actually inhibits the bigger one from reproducing. That's kind of right. so, bizarre. So the, the way to look at it is that the little virus is parasitizing the big virus in a, yeah. in a true sense. It's really, it's, it is infecting that virus and, um, and inhibiting its, its ability to live. Sure. So what, what you, raise, the, you, uh, raise a, you raise a good point, though, Dixon, because I've always thought, I actually have thought with uh, Sputnik, which is the virophage of <laughs> Ming virus, that, that <laughs> yes. the, word, the word virophage was kind of, kind of stretching it. It seemed to yeah. me more like, a, more like a satellite. I think the differences are subtle. In this particular case, one of the things that, a couple of things really impressed me. One is these electron micrographs that show the Ma virus assembling actually inside the factories of the uh -huh. uh, co-virus. All right, so that that looks a little more like a real parasitism. Plus, they have this uh -huh. um, uh, this analysis where they've looked at the transcriptional signals in the Ma virus. Now, this is bioinformatic. It's a little uh, uh, it's a little speculative, but it. It, the transcriptional promoter sequences in the Ma virus, or putative transcriptional promoter sequences, look the same as in the uh, co-virus, the, the, the big guy, as mm -hmm. if the Ma virus is using the transcriptional machinery from the co-virus. And so Got that uh, looks a little more like a real, a, a real molecular parasitism. The other thing that's just interesting here, here is that little, my dad's you mentioned before, he's Dixon, gonna be like, what, um, is this sort of, good for... The small, the small virus, or is yeah. it good for the host? Because yeah, the small yeah, virus, yeah, yeah. and in fact, they say here, eukaryotes that are susceptible to infection with these giant viruses will gain an advantage if they can associate themselves with these virophages uh -huh. because they will protect them. Sure. So maybe that explains the evolution of these small um, virophages, if you will. I don't like that name. What do you think, guys? Is a virophage not a good name? Uh, I've never been crazy about it. This uh, the, the, the justification in this case seems stronger than um, in uh, in the case of Sputnik. It seems to me. I'm I'm not. I've never been crazy about it. But you know what? What the heck? We're stuck with it. 
Well, okay. I, my okay. problem my problem with virophage is a phage is a virus. So we've taken a term that means virus and we're using it to sub describe a or to describe a subset of viruses in another context. I, I think it's a little confusing. I, I would I don't know. I I might call these something like uh, epiviruses or um, right. I'm kind of at a loss for a really good term for it. But but virophage seems a little off. It's a competition, though, it sounds like, for resources that, yeah, you know, sure. if you're going to put so much into the small virus, you can't get as much big virus. And <laughs> it's very interesting. Does, yeah. does the small virus ever integrate into the genome of the big virus? No, they actually looked and they didn't find ev any evidence for that, which let, doesn't let say it doesn't exist. Um, yeah. Because it, it, there, here... Uh, we're, we're, you know, you guys are, your, 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 um, Twiv audience will be like, yeah, yeah, you know, the cafeteria virus infects the, um, you know, <laughs> the, the, the Mar Maverick virus, and, and, you know, and they'll get it. So I want to, uh, not that my audience, there were main, well, my dad's listening, so I want to explain it to him. So you've got this cafeteria virus, which is a giant virus, like 730 <laughs> kilobase genome. I mean, that's 700,000 bases, uh, it's giant genome, and right. it, um, Parasitizes. Oh no! Wait, the cafeteria is only twenty genes or twenty KB. No, the cafeteria is the big no, the, one. The cafeteria virus is the big one. The seven hundred thousand okay. bases. Um, and wait, it, I thought the cafeteria it, was the host. The cafeteria. Yeah, but the cafeteria is, is virus the is. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's virus. That's, right. that's even bigger yet. But the virus is also called cafeteria virus. Uh, confusing. Right. Cafe, cafeteria <laughs> runs confusing. Versus, oh, okay. Oh, yes. So the <laughs> a virus, the small one, <laughs> my virus, the 20 kilobase genome, 20,000 pieces of DNA or uh, bases in yeah. the Mavirus, uh, so my virus, sorry, infects the cafeteria, which is the large one. So you've got this little small, small virus goes in and uh, infects a larger virus. The cafeteria virus. Which is infecting something even bigger yet. Which is infecting well, then. At least it infects bigger. the cell containing the larger virus. A lot of exactly. our exactly. debate here has been whether you can really call it infecting the virus. And that's oh. that's where that's where we're having a debate about whether to call it a virophage, yeah. which yeah. implies that it actually infects the virus, as opposed to just a satellite where it's using the bigger virus as a helper for its replication. So, which and I also just, just, to, just to beat a horse just to beat a horse that we uh, we hit frequently here on Twiv. Um, it depends, I mean, can something be infected? if it's not living. Ah. Right. Oh, no, yeah. no, no, it no. It sounds no, like two there. competing <laughs> viruses for the same set of resources to me. That's what it sounds like. You've got a viral factory going on, which has no complete virus particles whatsoever. And you've got a choice. You've got so much resource. This host cell has only got so much to, to give. And these viruses are competing for that resource. And it's apparently when the little one is present, the bigger one doesn't get as much as it usually gets. Right, the now factory is, is normally the factory is normally building Mack trucks, and somebody yeah, yeah, sneaking right. in and using the equipment to build bicycles, and that takes away from the resources that they Many would use to build trucks. Something okay, like now, that. That's right. Yeah. So one thing we haven't mentioned yet that's an important consequence of this, probably as an indirect consequence of inhibiting the replication of a large virus, <laughs> is that the cells live longer too. Ah, the host cell. Okay. There you go. So there is uh, an evolutionary advantage for the host cell. To uh, pick up and harbor this little virus because the little virus inhibits the growth of the big virus and the cell lives longer. And this is a marine flagellate, correct? A marine flagellate. Right. All right. So lots the, of stuff the going on out there in the natural world. Lots of stuff going on. Well, this guy, the uh, senior author on this paper, Curtis Suttle, uh, he's responsible for the care. He's done a lot of work on characterizing uh, viruses. Uh, marine viruses. He's responsible nice. for some of these numbers about there being what, 10 to the 11th phage particles per milliliter of seawater. 10 right. to the sixth. A ginormous the sixth. Number. Okay, fine. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot, a lot of, of stuff out there. Yeah, a lot of stuff out there. You know what? Someone has likened this to the uh, the true carbon sink for the ocean. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean that that may be where all the carbon is actually going. Yeah, the lysis of bacteria and we other can't see organisms by viruses in the yeah, ocean. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. So the other story the here, which is very interesting, is that this virus has genes which are also present in uh, jumping DNAs called transposons. Uh -huh. All right. Now, I thought, Mark, your audience would like this part. Uh, there are a couple <laughs> of different kinds of transposons. There are transposons related to retroviruses, that retroviruses encode an enzyme that can 
copy their RNA genome into DNA, and they also have an enzyme that can integrate that DNA into the host. So that one kind of transposon employs that mechanism. And then there's another kind of transposon, which is just made of DNA, and it can jump around the genome. And here's the part I think your audience will like. There are two mechanisms for movement of these DNA transposons. There's copy paste and cut and paste. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> sure. Right. Well, that makes sense, right? You can either copy it and double yep. it, and paste That's it, exactly, or you can you can snip it out and replace. You so combine cool, it, pop out whatever's the cool, there. The cool thing about this Ma virus, and the reason they call it Maverick, is because Maverick is a name for a DNA transposon. Is it has genes that are also found in these transposons. So it may be some kind of an ancestor of transposons. Hmm. Right, so, so they actually they do they do some analysis of this evolutionary relationship between these two. Um, it's not just a passing resemblance; it's actually a pretty strong um, homology between these two that suggests that either the Ma virus came from the transposable element or the transposable element came from the Ma virus. And they right. they argue, I think, pretty persuasively that the <clears throat> that it's the the Ma virus was the ancestor. Um, that gave rise to the transposable element. Um, so this is, you know, we've got these transposable elements hopping around and there's been a debate for a very long time. Well, did viruses come from transposable elements or did transposable elements come from viruses? And I, I think this is a case, at least one case, where um, the evidence would point toward the transposon coming from um, the virus. So you had a Ma virus ancestor, they call it, um, giving you know, infecting a um, some cell in the primordial ocean, um, and it ended up transferring its DNA into the host DNA and integrating and becoming a transposable element in that DNA. Could it be both? I mean, could biologically speaking there be both? I mean, the fact that we can think about it plausibly would suggest that chances are there are both pieces of DNA that jumped out of a, a genome and became a virus versus uh, the other possibility of the DNA, the virus infecting and becoming a permanent piece of DNA inside the genome right. that then became right. It's, and it's And it's not necessarily a one-way trip, I would think, um, because once you're integrated as a transposon, I mean, it's not a huge leap to go from there to being a virus again. In this particular case, it does look like it probably went from virus to transposon, but yeah, it. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, this brings up some subtleties about the genetic content of uh, both of these things, because one of the things I notice is that the genes that are homologous between the Ma virus and the transposon include a capsid protein and an integrase, right? Mm -hmm. Both of these things have both of those things. Now, if you got a capsid protein, that implies that you would encapsidate the DNA at some point and you would be a, a virus. So it doesn't necessarily make any sense that a, cap, a transposon would have a capsid gene. Conversely, if you're, a vi if you're a virus that doesn't integrate, it doesn't make any sense to me to have an integrase. So right. it implies that both of these things genetically are sort of positioned, uh, if you like, between transposon and virus or capable of doing both or have done one or the other recently. Uh, so it's a, an interesting uh, situation. The other thing, the other gene that interests me, uh, this is a little more subtle maybe, is that the, they have a, it's a polymerase uh, that, it's a polymerase that copies DNA using a terminal protein. This is a mechanism that's used for uh, a couple of bacteriophage and, uh, and an adenovirus where the DNA is linear and has a terminal protein and uses a special polymerase to do this. But the Ma virus genome, according to these guys, is circular. So that doesn't make any sense to me. So there's some funny business going on with the genetic content that, that has implications for the evolution uh, of these viruses. Hmm. It's also worth pointing out that so the name of this virus was named after Mariner. Mariner is a kind of transposon. And we have uh, quite a few of these Mariner transposons in us. We have about 14,000 copies in our genome, which, which is about two and a half million base pairs. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard the science fiction novel called The Mariner Project, but that was sort of inspired by this Mariner uh, transposon. 
Hmm. By the way, I, transposons is a jumping gene to the general Trans audience here. A transposons is a, uh, a exactly. small segment of DNA that acts somewhat like a virus, I suppose, in that it can uh, jump from uh, out of the cell and, and throw itself into another cell and integrate into that genome and okay. pass so, genetic information on. So yeah, should we talk we again about whether viruses are alive? Okay, because <laughs> it, always, it always raises the, if viruses are alive, then you have to ask, are transposons alive? Okay. Well, how many more genes does this uh, large virus need before it becomes classified as another kind of organism? Good question. Good question. People I mean, have said this is sort of bridging now the gap between viruses and Chlamydia and would cells. be the next group up. Are there bigger viruses? What is the actual limit exactly. to the size of exactly. a virus? Or when you pare down, I know they did this experiment with E. coli. They just cut out all the numbers essential genes and what do they end up with like 365 genes that in a culture plate supplying almost all the nutrients you can still get the bacteria to look like a bacteria that has something like 3,200 genes hey, smaller than this. It, yeah smaller yeah. than this virus exactly so exactly the idea of a virus replicating in a virus is is wrong because you, the virus doesn't have any resources to provide the other what, what can happen as we know in this case the virus replicates in the cell and then the other virus parasitizes the replication site. Right. 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 If, you de right. if you define the virus as only being the genetic material in the capsid floating around free in the world, um, <laughs> then that's true. A virus can't replicate in a virus. But if you define the virus as its life cycle, um, then a virus can certainly replicate within the life cycle of another virus and, and use its machinery and, and parasitize it. Well, doesn't that happen a lot, though, with viruses like influenza, that sometimes you can get two different strains into the same cell and they co-mix mm -hmm. and co-exchange sure. genomic material? So, sure. so that's not an unusual situation. But in this case, though, the bit little virus is inhibiting the growth of the yes. big virus. And that's, that's probably the basis for calling it a parasitism rather than something else. But actually, it, it might just be <laughs> resource <laughs> reallocation. I mean, it's I think it's crazy. Resource. There's so many levels here. Transpose on small virus infecting sure. big virus, big virus sure. infecting host cell. Um, I mean, it's, well, it's like, and also if you think about the um, the possible origin of this, they speculate a little bit about this in the paper, and um, the the upshot of it, as I understand it, is that probably at some point in the distant past, some May virus ancestor. Um, infected or managed to evolve within the context of an infected uh, cafeteria ancestor in the plankton. Um, and it provided a selective advantage because it was this, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So the virus of my virus is my is my immune system in a certain <laughs> sense. Um, and, and if you're a little one celled organism and you're swimming around and you've got this big virus infecting you and you you can harbor this little virus that uh, that nips at the heels of the big virus, then that's an antiviral. <laughs> it's an antiviral defense system. Um, so, but, to some extent, there's a selective pressure to keep that little virus around, <laughs> and integrating it into your genome would be a way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this could this could questions. also be the origin of an immune system. Interesting. Yeah. And then I the have, transposon becomes a series of uh, mutated forms of the same uh, antibody, so to speak. Hmm. Let, let me yeah. ask, a, I've got just two basic questions. One, the first one is, I'm trying to visualize here a host <laughs> cell with a, a baby virus or a small the maver ma maverick virus and, and then the big virus. Do, now, they've lost their, their capsids and it's just DNA floating in the cytoplasm or is it in the nucleus and they're interacting, functionally interacting together or do they actually fuse and interact and become no, there's a, the uh, the big virus is this is a cytoplasmic virus as I understand it and it sets up replication uh, factories in the cytoplasm and in the supplementary material for this um, paper there's a beautiful electron micrograph that shows a virus factory uh, and it's surrounded by some assembled big viruses the um, cafeteria virus and inside the factory you can see assembling the little virus <laughs> uh, so so they're they're happening the little virus is actually apparently replicating inside the factory that's normally established by the big virus and the factory it presumably contains the big virus dna so that the dna's of the two viruses 
it looks to me as if they're mixed together in this factory that's normally established by the cafeteria virus. Wow. Wow. The, the, sec the, the second yeah, question well, is, right. <laughs> um, the, 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 the small virus, this Maverick virus, which has a genome that looks very much like uh, the genome or the, the DNA sequence of a jumping gene, this, this right. mobile element, DNA element that, uh, you know, probably inv is involved in evolution. Are you... Now, the last show that we did on Futures in Biotech, we had Susan Lindquist on talking about how a heat shock protein, which is a, a protein that stabilizes uh, other proteins during stress, um, could respond to envir the environment. And when the environment has, like, you know, very stressful uh, conditions like heat, uh, it would tighter out this heat shock protein uh, away from its, its target proteins, which it normally acts on, which are, are signaling molecules and information molecules that then go and, um, uh, and, and by tightering it away from those in very important signaling dip switches, information dip switches in the cell, you would spawn um, a more a phenotypic change. And she was suggesting that this is a major well, link between the environment and the environment having an, an active role in spawning evolution. And I asked her, is HSP90 the only or the most important element in uh, spawning evolution? My question to you guys is, is this Maverick virus, the small little virus, which can then turn into a, a jumping DNA, a piece of jumping DNA, or even just the jumping DNA, uh, jumping gene, um, are those important elements in our evolution? Absolutely. Oh, no question. Absolutely, yeah. Not, yes. not, just tran not just transposons, but all viruses are known to move DNAs around from organism to organism. So they're huge role, they play huge roles in evolution. This is a lateral uh, way of changing your genome right. rather than having to go through reproduction. So do you want to get a, the flu? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I guess if you, well, no, not necessarily. G Mark, you know, you can get other viruses that don't make you sick and they can do good things. And I think what's happening in nature and animals that we don't know much about is that there's a lot of uh, yeah. movement of genes by viruses, by viruses that are not harmful in any way. And we're just starting to learn about this. Right, and we certainly know about this um, from bacteria with bacteriophages. And you have phages that can confer sure. um, abilities to survive in other environments or antibiotic resistances and, and it's um, you know, useful genes being transferred around by viruses. Yeah. Well, just and we talk about about this on TWIV all the time, but the, the Futures in Biotech audience may not be as familiar with this. The uh, human genome is uh, a very large percentage of it is carcasses of old viruses, right? <laughs> yeah, 40%. Yeah. I think we discussed it with Mark Gerstein, who, uh, who's kind of a bioinformatician that uh, looks at the genome as an archive, right? A mm -hmm. historical record. Yes. It is? Sure. Yeah. Sure it is. It's, so, it's a fossil wow. record for sure. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, hey, Mark, really can we cool. move on to uh, our Absolutely. second paper? Because I yes. think this is pretty interesting, too. Uh, this is yep. called Unintended Spread of a Biosafety Level 2 Recombinant Retrovirus. <laughs> and Oh, my Alan, God, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so Sorry, Alan, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling a little peaked myself. But we can qualify that. <laughs> Alan, Alan, you Wells? discovered this. Why don't you uh, summarize it for us? <laughs> Yeah, so these folks, uh, this paper actually came out in 2009, um, but apparently nobody noticed it. And uh, I, was, I was doing a search on something else, and I stumbled across it, and I said, wow, this is really, really interesting, um, especially in light of some of the other discussions we've been having on TWIV about um, contamination or potential for contamination of cell lines with various retroviruses. Um, and so these folks, um, uh, a German group, um, Worked. Uh, they were they were working with this cell line, a uh, very common cell line, two nine three T cells, uh, which is a uh, I think a human embryonic kidney cell line, um, and they they had these uh, these vesicles that were forming um, in the in the cell culture, and they wanted to look at them um, and see well what's going on with these vesicles the cells are forming. So they did uh, an electron micrograph, and they saw that the vesicles were budding off. Um, things that looked very much like, uh, yeah, there's the picture, um, that looked very much like retroviral particles, um, which is not quite what they'd expected because this wasn't supposed to be an infected cell line. So they, um, 
they went and looked and they did a, uh, a sort of an open-ended RNA, um, RT-PCR and also um, uh, regular PCR uh, to see what the genomes were like in there. And ultimately what they pull out is two different retroviruses. One is a, um, uh, what is it? It's a, uh, a squirrel monkey squirrel retrovirus. Monkey. Right. And the other, so, so that's interesting. You know, you've got your cultures contaminated with the squirrel monkey retrovirus that I, I don't think they'd worked with. Um, but the other is, is a real bizarre one. It's a murine leukemia virus like virus. Um, mm. But it is not, it's not XMRV and it's not a, a normal wild occurring murine leukemia virus. They did a database search and what popped up was a recombinant retrovirus that was created in the mid 1980s sometime um and uh you know so this is a this is a, a virology lab was working uh on retroviruses created this recombinant made a plasmid of it and these folks in this german lab have never worked with this plasmid <laughs> um but it has near 100 percent identity with the retrovirus that's budding out of their 293t cells so somehow, probably by swapping cell lines with other labs and working with collaborators and, and who knows what other mechanism, they got this recombinant retrovirus that was made in some other lab um, 30 years ago and that just is now inside their, their cell culture. And they, they do some subsequent experiments and determine that it... Um, both of these viruses are, are fairly promiscuous. They'll replicate in a bunch of different cell types. And they also went to their freezer and looked at other, spe other samples they had of their cell lines, and they found they had a whole bunch of them that were contaminated with this sort of thing. Sure. Um, so it's a, it's a systemic problem. Um, and I, to me, the, the really surprising bit was that one of these viruses came from a lab. <laughs> Right. <laughs> That's not good news, is it? It's well, that, that one of them came from a lab Oops. and was then transferred to other labs that weren't working on it unknowingly. Um, right. And the, the reason this is interesting for a recombinant retrovirus is because these are supposed to be handled under what's called biosafety level 2 or BL2 or P2 conditions, which is not, you know, that's not the whole bubble suit or what have you that you see in the movies, but it's it's some degree of precaution that you take to keep the virus from getting out into the world. So you're supposed to, uh, to bleach things before you throw them down the sink and autoclave your you know, virus when you're done with it and, and store things separately and not cross-contaminate. Um, but clearly, that is not sufficient to keep this from getting sent around. And people who are working with murine-like retroviruses or discovering murine-like retroviruses um, are susceptible to exactly this sort of thing and there's no there's no telling how widespread it is I well think people the, the, people exchange cell lines all the time you know i've sent cells we work with i've sent to a, a number of different laboratories over the years so all you would have to do is get a get a cell line that's contaminated from another laboratory and uh, then there's the potential for contamination to other lines in your own laboratory and then you send it somewhere else and somebody else gets contaminated with the same thing so it's uh, it's uh, once once you know that this is a possibility, despite uh, BSL-2 containment, it's, uh, it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise. I think m many labs have contamination that they're not aware of. And yeah. this paper underscores how easy it is. It's pervasive. And I think, Mark, if you check many of the cell lines in your company there, you might find some <laughs> viruses are, as well. I mean, the point <laughs> is that these viruses are not harmful to the cells. So if you look at your cells in a microscope, they look completely normal. But yet the virus is there, the cell has evolved to deal with the virus in its own way. So you can't tell. And in fact, Mark, they used mass spectrometry to look at the supernatants of these cells to identify the virus in there. Can you imagine? They, they took the super, They did total, you don't need it, but that's what they used to figure out what was in there. Right, and I, the I reason like they the had to do that, that was because they've, you know, there's no telling what the cell line might be contaminated with. They just stumbled on this because they happened to, I guess, have an electron microscope sitting around and the ability to use it. And so they looked and they saw these retrovirus-like particles, um, which means they, it, it pretty much means that there are going to be other retroviruses out there contaminating other cell lines, and we don't know 
we don't know what and we don't know how widespread this is, but I, I, I would be willing to bet that this is going to be a nearly ubiquitous problem. It's, wow. You know, you can control. So the whole point of, you know, for example, we use cell lines, we use Chinese hamster ovary cells and we express a gene, we overexpress it so that we're well above the endogenous levels of protein. And then we look at the functional response, the physiological response of these cells uh, as they're made. And we have a control cell line expressing a different protein without that function. And now we're eliminating all cellular effects and just looking at the, the, the numbers that we can collect that differ between the functional protein and the non-functional functional protein. So I guess with controls, you can really not worry too much about, um, you know, these viral infections of your cell lines. But I suppose if you're trying to study something that's an endogenous level uh, protein, you know, something that's native to the protein uh, to the cell. I mean, uh, then you really well, I think yeah. If you're doing if you're doing basic cell biology, this is probably not a big concern because, as you say, you can control for the other factors simply by using the same cell line in your experiment right. and your controls. Um, but where this comes up, and where it, the the reason it it really came up in my literature search was we've been talking on TWIV about XMRV, uh, which was discovered in 2006, um, and we are now getting increasing reports that it may have been a lab accident in itself. Um, and it, it, this paper underscores just how something like that could spread. And it also underscores the caution that you need if you're going and looking for viruses. So this is a, this is not something that that undermines all cell culture experiments by any means. And I don't even think it undermines uh, virology experiments where you're you're using a, a lytic virus, for example. Um, but what it shows is that if you go and you look for uh, retroviruses in a cell line, or you look for other viruses that are, that are, could be in there without killing the cells you may very well find them and it may very well be meaningless. What if, let me pose this question, if you're, you have a bioreactor and you've got HeLa cells growing and you're using it to amplify uh, a strain of influenza that's going to be used as a um, vaccine, uh, do we currently have methods to verify that we're not making a, uh, an extra vaccine at the same time? <laughs> Well, the, the, the answer, Mark, is that you wouldn't use HeLa cells because it's a it's a transformed line, and okay. we can't do that. So you have to use cell lines that are qualified for use in growing vaccines. Um, okay. The answer is yes. We look by PCR to make sure there aren't other viruses in there. But last year we talked on TWIV of an example of an investigator who bought ten different human viral vaccines, and he deep sequenced them and found other viruses, including a retrovirus in some of those human vaccines. Last, a few weeks ago, we talked about pet vaccines that are contaminated with retroviruses. So we still are not really 100% at, at detecting all the contamination. At least Having said production. that, the, the safety testing on vaccines would certainly catch anything and the, and the aftermarket um, monitoring on them would certainly pick up anything if these viruses actually had an effect. Um, but it is, um, you know, it's, it is potentially a problem for people at the research stage, I think. Uh, this, there was another uh, report that I think we discussed here from, I just looked it up, from 2009 where Genzyme had a problem where their bioreactors got contaminated with a virus. Okay, and That's that right. shut, shut them down for a while. So yeah. uh, the good news is that people do check for this stuff. Uh, and the bad news is that it's a problem now and then. I must say I had the cynical thought as I read this paper that if I could uh, have a publication for every time I contaminated my cells, I would have a really long <laughs> CV. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Contamination well, some of the early conversations that we had around the table back in 19, whatever, 64, 65, uh, were just about that. What constitutes a germ-free animal? You know, you can check for, vir for uh, fungi and bacteria. And, of course, protozoans and helminths are out of the question, too, except for one. Well, I, I won't even talk about that one. But you can prevent that simply by cesareanly sectioning uh, the pregnant female and, and carrying the uh, embryos into the, uh, or pups, I should say, into the incubator and making sure that they're sterile. Transmitting viruses vertically uh, in the genome and in the cytoplasm was the biggest worry that they had. And I guess even at the organism level, it's still a big problem. And uh, one which if you don't look for it, 
and it's there, it could alter. Remember what happened when everyone found Sendai virus in their mouse colonies and found out that Sendai virus, of course, it comes from that little town that just got creamed, unfortunately, um, which reminded me of it. Uh, it, it, it. It inhibits the immune system. So all the experiments that all these people were carrying out with these mice that they thought were pristine were actually under uh, some immunosuppression induced by their viral infections, and they had to re redo all those experiments. And it's very right. expensive. I, I, and I, 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 I think we should I, oh, go ahead, Red. No, I just I was recalling uh, Dixon reminded me that there was a, a, a talk that I recall from a couple of years ago from Skip Virgin's lab about um, ah. discovering a, a, a mouse virus that they weren't aware of before that, uh, as I can vaguely recall, influence the immune response of the mouse uh -huh. uh, to yep. an, to another infection okay so yeah sure. there's uh potentially all kinds of stuff like this going on that we're not aware of that we'll find out bit by bit yeah i remember right. the jackson and, labs went crazy trying to get rid of it yeah yeah and the 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 ones that have been found have often been found in the context of somebody getting a a vaccine or a biological product ready for market right. exactly. where they're they are going to go and do this due diligence and search for everything under the sun and and then they'll find oh hey you know you've got this virus in there um but that has not been something that people did with their research samples because yeah. nobody thought yeah. it mattered and it exactly. and to me what this paper really brought home was uh actually it can matter depending on what you're looking at Sure. Actually, we've talked on TWIV several times before, uh, in the past about getting somebody on who knew something about how uh, uh, products were screened for adventitious agents. And there's just been recently been a, a meeting in Washington about this following on the uh, contamination uh, of uh, the rotavirus vaccine with uh, porcine circovirus 1. It would... Uh, it would Really, be interesting to get somebody on the show who uh, who knew something about this and could tell us how things are usually screened and what the plans are for the future. It actually might be a good topic for futures biotech. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that's a good idea. We should we can identify someone <clears throat> who does that. But I would like to leave this with one final thought, and that is, we're not trying to be alarmist. All the vaccines for humans are well tested, and there are no adverse effects. Uh, that could be attributed to these contaminants. So I, I don't want people to think that these are making vaccines unsafe in any way. We do find these uh, adventitious agents from time to time, and we suspect that they are in inconsequential because the clinical trials of the vaccine show that they're safe. And they could even help. They might even help. Who knows? Yeah. And the, and the technology is improving all the time. So, uh, I mean, the good news is that we are discovering these things and the technology is getting better yeah. all the time and will help us uh, make the safest products possible. Well, and in fact, ask... the, a major reason that people had not noticed this in the past was that these <clears throat> things had not been causing clinical problems. I mean, right. if you look at the safety profile for um, for particularly vaccines, um, it's it's astonishing how safe these things are and how and how closely that's tracked. Sure. Um, but because it's not been tracked in a research context, um, nobody nobody noticed these uh, these non clinically relevant viruses that are that are just being transferred. Because you know when you when you exchange cells with a, a colleague, they're also exchanging cells with everyone they've ever exchanged cells with. Sure. Okay. The, the biggest a glory in, in the real knows. world here, I think, is organ transplantation. And the fear that if you could overcome the heterologous graft versus host response or host versus graft mm -hmm. response uh, with some trick uh, so that you could use uh, pig organs or some other animal organs, monkey organs, that you'd still have to worry deeply about the, the hidden virus infections that might still be there. Yeah. But, you know, we shouldn't also be spend your whole life scared. Anybody who has a kid in kindergarten will realize that the schmutz is all over the place. And it's just horrible. <laughs> oh, that's right. And any parent will know that every three months they're going to get a, a, a weird cold. One that gives a headache, one that gives a sore throat, one that gives an upper sure. respiratory tract infection. And to their parents. <laughs> well, yeah, not just the kids. Oh, some all the kids, 24 hours later, they're, they're, they're like, boom, back. <laughs> it's the parents. That's right. Get it. That's right. Um, Mark, so, I suspect that these 
infections at a young age are actually important for educating your immune system. And there have been Absolutely. a number of studies, as, as Rich referred to earlier, which show that some infections can confer protection against other uh, microbes. So we, we still have a lot to learn, but not every infection is bad. I'm sure. Right. And of course, you don't want to you don't want to get the infections that can kill you. Um, but the ones that are that are subclinical, um, sure. sure, they're they're showing your immune system something. Do you guys Indeed. all like one thing that's really important is to ask the pros what they do. And you guys are pros with respect to viruses. Do you guys get the influenza vaccine when the, the season hits? Do you, uh, do you go yes. and get your shot? Yeah. Yes. yes, absolutely. Everyone? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Well, so do I. <laughs> I just, uh, I just want to say to the audience, yes, go get your influenza vaccine. You want to save uh, your community. It's not just for you, but you're also preventing the spread to others that may not be as resilient. Uh, elderly folk, people that are uh, immunosuppressed because they've received a transplant, kidney transplant, uh, cornea transplant, anything, they're uh, immunosuppressed. So you want to, not just for you's sake, you know, you, most, you hear a lot of people say, oh, I don't need to get it, I'll survive it, it's just a week and, you know, I'll get over it, you know. But you're passing it on and you want to be good to your family sure. and, and good to your friends. Yeah, I just gave a flu lecture to my, uh, to my virology class today and pointed out to them that the uh, average yearly excess mortality from influenza in this uh, country is uh, 40,000 people a year. Right. That's, a, that, that's a big number. That's flu right. is not just another cold it's yeah, and just, to, just to expand on this um it's not I, it's not just that i go out and get the flu shot every year my daughter's fully vaccinated my wife is on on the board with all this too and uh you know we absolutely take this seriously speaking of vaccines uh if we could move on to some emails mark we the yes, first one has to do with vaccines so, so on twiv we have a great uh, audience who, that interacts with us via sending questions by email. And I thought it would be fun to show the, the Futures in Biotech audience some of these. We have so many that we can't possibly read them all. It takes us months to catch up. But uh, we, have, we have some lined up today, and I thought we would uh, go through some of them. The first one is from Todd, who writes, I'm a computer programmer who listens to podcasts on my long commute. The highest science education that I've had was college chemistry. As an electrical engineer, the science classes we took tended to be not biology oriented. So while some of it is over my head, to say that I find biotech and molecular biology fascinating is an understatement. Virus related question. I also have a picture of me with the mumps at around four years old, 1974. When did the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine come out? Was I one of the last in my generation to have it? I've never met anybody my age who's had the mumps, only older than me. P.S. Lately, I've been listening to the Fib, Twiv, and Twip podcasts <laughs> to the point where I'm neglecting my techie podcasts. You guys uh -oh. are causing me to lose some of my geek creds. Uh-oh. So I oh, thought, these are, yeah, no, this is uber geek stuff. This is uber yeah. geek. <laughs> so, so Rich and Alan, you have answers to this question. Yeah. So the the first mumps vaccine was uh, made in 1950 and used. It was a killed vaccine. That means they grow up wild type virus and they inactivate it with formalin or or something like that. <clears throat> so it doesn't actually replicate in you. And that was used between 1950 and 1978. Uh, but it didn't give l very long-lasting immunity. <clears throat> the first live attenuated vaccine was developed in 1967, so that overlapped the uh, use of the killed vaccine, um, and and that was a uh, that was a better immunogen. And Alan, you came up with the MMR, right? Uh, so um, so then 1971, uh, the MMR combination vaccine um, came out, and that was. Uh, of course, you know, like most of the vaccines from that period, that was a Maurice Hilleman product. Um, so that came out in 71, and that's what I would expect he would have gotten. Right. If he was, uh, let me see, what did he say? He got the mumps when he was 70. So he was born in 1970. So right. he would have gotten, I suppose he could have gotten the, the inactivated vaccine, but uh, more likely that he got the MMR vaccine or the live attenuated one. Uh, these... Vaccines are not 100 percent. You know, there's uh, uh, they're in the 90 percent or 90 percent plus. Uh, so uh, and that was 
shortly after the uh, vaccines first came into use. So I don't know uh, how suppressed wild type mumps would have been at that point, whether it was really down to baseline or not. But it's not impossible to get the vaccine and also get the disease. It's right, particularly rare. if you're if you're in an area where a lot of other people have not gotten the vaccine, right. um, and then there won't be the herd immunity, which is one of the reasons that everybody needs to get the vaccine, is so that you don't, uh, um, you know, so you don't kill other people with it. All right, our next email is from Peter, who writes, "I really enjoy TWIV and especially TWIP." <laughs> the Socratic method to teaching parasitism works for me. I am an aerospace engineer, but I now work in IT. I'm an engineer at heart, but I find parasitology fascinating, and viruses are like little machines, so also fascinating to an engineer. In your recent TWIP discussion of Giardia, you noted that the UV pen is ineffective against cysts because of their low metabolic rate or more specifically i think it was because their dna was inactive i don't know that was i didn't know that was a requirement for uv to work so i wonder is uv light effective in killing viruses in water mm -hmm. what did you say about giardia dixon do you remember uh, good question <laughs> you don't remember we'll have to go revisit that episode to find out what I, exactly what i said but um if an organism isn't dividing, then there are certain precautions that don't work uh, versus ones that do work. So maybe that's what we were discussing. Oh, so so D UV will cross-link DNA. Sure, it makes thymine dimers right. out of DNA. So if the DNA is not replicating, it will not have a lethal effect. That's correct. But as soon as the DNA begins to Starts, multi, then right. it will be dead in the water. Exactly. Okay, so exactly. maybe that's what you were maybe, saying. Maybe that's what we were So it won't kill a cyst because a cyst is a non-replicating form. Here, here. Right. That's correct. But as soon as the cyst begins to germinate, would that's, that be the right word? Unless, of course, its repair mechanism comes along. Yes, fixes that's the dimer. Right. Now, as far as water goes, UV doesn't go very far in no, water. it does not. So we, when we inactivate viruses by UV, we make sure they're in a very thin layer we of water. We pasteurize it. Well, that's, that's basically the point. You make a very thin layer. Yes, so the UV can penetrate. That's Otherwise, exactly right. it won't go into a tube, for example, of, of an inch in diameter. You got it. He says, I seem to recall that radiation is an effective treatment for cancer because cancer cells divide so rapidly. Is that the same effect? Mm, a little bit different idea. Well, you, you are killing cells, and there are more cancer cells because they're multiplying quicker. Sure, sure. So you have well, and burden. the cancer cells usually have um, defects in their DNA repair mechanism, so they're more susceptible to radiation than healthy cells. Yeah, That's yeah. right. That's right. Anything else to add to that, gentlemen? All right. Uh, hey, Mark, are you there? I'm right here. <laughs> how, we do, how we doing on time, Mark? We're fine. Um, we're okay? Yeah, well, we're, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Are we doing <laughs> make it. That's, that's just... Should we do another email? Is that okay? Absolutely. Go for it. Yeah. All right. We have one from Aaron. Dear Twiv, I know my last set of questions about endogenous retroviruses was long, but I'm still holding out hope you can answer some of them. I've sent similar questions to several virologists and haven't received any answers. Well, Aaron, this is the place to go. In fact, we, we answered these a couple of episodes ago. I've heard you guys talk about viruses evolving to become less virulent. Could you explain this to me? Are we really saying that the immune system of their hosts have evolved to resist the viruses rather than the viruses changing something to become less virulent? My understanding of viruses is that they harm the host merely by reproducing and using up the cell's systems. I understand that very few produce proteins that are actually toxic to the cell. Since viruses consist of only a handful of genes that are dedicated to the production of new viruses, what genes can be mutated to decrease the virulence of a virus? It seems that if one of the viral genes are seriously mutated, the virus will be unable to produce new viable viruses. Will that mean that the virus is less virulent? It also means that the virus will cease to exist. On the other hand, a virus host is a complex organism with many genes. A host can experience a mutation in an immunity gene that allows it to resist an infection without changing anything else in the host. A virus doesn't have this luxury. Any mutation will either cripple it or allow it to sustain its infection, as is the case with HIV. The only neutral mutation I can think of in a virus is one that causes it to infect a different cell type. Is this what you mean by a virus evolving to become less virulent, that it now infects a new type of cell 
that isn't as critical to the host organism. The way I understand it, a virus is either replicating and causing damage to the host, or it is not replicating and it is latent or eliminated. I'm not sure what the middle ground is where a virus is happily replicating yet is not virulent. I hope you understand the gist of what I'm trying to say. Anybody want to take a crack at that? Well, uh, uh, it's, it's both, Aaron. Uh, there's a tendency to, for the viruses to become less virulent and for the host to become uh, more resistant. The classic demonstration of this that we've talked about several times, including last week, and that's the situation with uh, releasing uh, myxoma virus in Australia to control the rabbits. And in the first year or two, it, uh, the virus killed all the rabbits. And then over time, an equilibrium, a uh, new equilibrium was established where the rabbits became more resistant and the uh, virus became less virulent. Uh, this is, I mean, obviously the Fairly obviously, it's to the rabbit's benefit to become more resistant, and uh, it's a little more subtle. But it's a little, uh, it's it's also to the virus's um, advantage to become a little less virulent because you want you really don't want to kill the host if uh, if you don't have to. And I would also say that um, <clears throat> uh, there are a lot of genes in many viruses. I would even go so far as to say most viruses that are not absolutely essential. Uh, for the virus to go through its replication cycle, but rather are accessory genes that are there for the specific purpose of dealing with the immune response from the host. And here again, the myxoma virus is a great example because uh, it's a fairly large pox virus, and these guys have uh, dozens, uh, up to 100 genes, I think, that are there specifically to confound the immune response of the host. And so if any of those genes is crippled, the virus can still replicate, but it becomes uh, significantly uh, less virulent. So there's a constant tug of war going on between the host and the virus, mostly at the level uh, uh, of, of immunity. Right. The way to look at this is from an evolutionary perspective, um, where, yes, it's certainly in the virus's interest to replicate rapidly and, <clears throat> and to a relatively high titer, um, but it is not to the vi in the virus's interest to kill the host instantly, because then it won't transmit to a new host. And depending on how it's transmitted, it may not be in the virus's interest to cripple the host and make them, uh, you know, so febrile that they can't get out of bed. Because if you're if you're an airborne virus uh, infecting a human, let's say, um, you need that human to get up and go interact with other humans. So there's a there is a selective pressure on the virus to limit its um, its lethality. Uh, and its virulence, um, but at the same time to replicate to a high enough level and in such a way that it can transmit to a new host. And also replication is not the same as being virulent. A virus right. can replicate very well, but not cause disease. So you have this statement here, you say a virus is either replicating and causing disease or not, and that's not the case. There are many examples of viruses replicating and not causing disease in the host. And as, as Alan says, Killing a host is not always evolutionarily advantageous. And so many virus host interactions have evolved so that both survive and both prosper. There are several, several really good examples of this. Polyoma viruses, I, I always like that example. Uh, in fact, probably don't cause uh, any disease in most people. Most people are infected with them and they establish a persistent infection in the kidneys. And so you're carrying around these viruses and undergoing a low level of uh, replication all the time. Herpes viruses are a little more complex, but the same sort of thing, HSV type one that causes cold sores. You might think that only 15% of the population uh, uh, well, there's about 15% of the population that comes up with cold sores, but there's over 90% of the population that has HSV-1. It spends part of its time latent and uh, occasionally uh, goes through a little uh, active replication that doesn't cause you any problem, but just enough so that the virus can be transmitted. Yeah, and I guess I should say something too then. Yellow fever <laughs> virus is probably the best vaccine virus that we've had for a long time. And it, we got it by simply serially transferring it from animal to animal to animal until it lost the ability to kill, but it still could replicate. So that's... Yeah, that's so Mark, that's, what, uh, 
what we usually do at this point in TWIV is a pick of the week. Would you like to start out? <laughs> sure. sure. <clears throat> but before we do, um, I'd just like to say that I, I think we should learn something from viruses and not necessarily destroy our ecosystem. Do your best to minimize your leave no trace, you know, a little cup's kit uh, <laughs> motto here, and leave no trace and don't destroy your uh, your host and our host is the earth. Uh, so, you know, let's yeah. limit uh, renewable resources, all that jazz. So <laughs> viruses have, have been evolving for millions of years and they know not to you know, to, to go too far. Um, so my pick of the week is a, a really handy tool that I use in the lab all the time. It's great for PIs that are trying to really um, get a handle of, of lab books if they want to keep up with data, if, if they're analyzing data for a data analyst. Um, it's a little app for the iPhone. Um, it's called Jotnot. And what it does is it's one of those How do you scanners. spell that? J is in Jack, O-T, N is in Nancy, O-T. So Jotnot. Uh, okay. it's, I'm sure it's, there's uh, another one's called Scanner Pro uh, by a company called uh, Riedel, I think it is. But Scanner Pro or Jotnot. But I use Jotnot. And what you do is you just take your iPhone or your smartphone, just open the lab book, take a picture, turn the page, take another picture, turn the page, Goodness. take another picture. And then it, it processes them, turns them into a PDF. You can move the pages around, email yourself a PDF. Holy now. Cow. Yeah, so now it, with like kind of those little spy camera deals where you used to go in and, you know, while you're dressed all in black and you snuck that night. <laughs> That's right. Tick, 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 tick. Well, this is the <laughs> fastest tool to scan. You don't want to sit there and scan your lab book. One of the problems with doing uh, bench work is, you know, having an analog lab book and then having your data collected on a plate reader where you've got kinetics and stuff. You sort of got to merge the two. It's really hard to figure out, well, what, then you grab the lab book and you're, this puts the two together, makes a quick PDF of your, your lab, your bench notes. Um, it's a good backup and literally instant. You take your picture, it uh, processes it into a cool. high contrast PDF, and then you do several. You can flip the pages around, email it to yourself and to, your, to someone else at the same time if you're, trying, if you're collaborating. Um, it's, the, it's the most useful tool in the lab, uh, and one of the most useful tools for me at uh, documenting uh, the, the lab books. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, that Dixon, Dixon, if you want to use this, Dixon, you, you have to get an iPhone. By the way, Mark, did you know that that's how they discovered that Rene Dubose was actually the first person on Earth to isolate and identify an antibiotic because of his lab book dates? It preceded Alexander Fleming by about two years. That wasn't until very recently that everybody found it out. <laughs> so that was cool, very cool. Dixon, do you have a pick of the week for us? I have a pick of the week. It was a generic pick. I read it, uh, I believe I read this on PubMed about an outbreak in China last year of a new bunya virus, which is transmitted by ticks. And it's got a very high mortality rate. And uh, it's one that had never been described before. So you actually found the article for me. Yes. And um, it's, it's got a very complicated name because it has an abbreviation which involves uh, severe fever and thrombocytopenia associated with a novel. And thrombocytopenia means to the other people mm -hmm. that don't know what that is that you lose your platelets and that uh, would mm -hmm. prevent you from clotting your blood and then you can just bleed to death basically uh, from common things like brushing your teeth or something. Uh, it's an awful bunya virus. I guess it's not a very common one because they just recently discovered it, but... Uh, <laughs> That's my pick of the week. Well, that's actually something I have on the agenda for a future TWIV. So Excellent. We'll good. discuss it in I'd some, like to do this some, some detail. detail. That's Thank good. you, Dixon. Yeah. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I have uh, a pick that was <laughs> oh, wait, sent do to you, me Alan, by... do you have to leave in four minutes? I do, yes. Go for Alan, it, Alan. Yes. You want to go first so that you could leave? Sure, go, go ahead, sure. Alan. I'll go ahead. Um, my uh, my totally self promotional pick of the week this week, um, and uh, I already pinged you guys with this, but um, yeah. it's a it's a new blog um, that I just started. I'm still maintaining my regular blog, but uh, uh, this one um, is uh, I I've had these letters that my grandparents exchanged. Um, and they date back to World War I. Um, and they've just been sitting in a crate in my basement, and I've been moving them around from place to place. And I finally got around to starting reading them, and I realized um, there's a really, really cool story in these letters um, that, uh, that I think a lot of people might be interested in. So instead of just, I'd been thinking I would transcribe them or scan them and just distribute them to the family. So instead, I've actually put them online. Um, and I've, I have scheduled the blog software so it'll be posting a new letter each day 
um, from now on, and I've already scheduled the ones a week in advance, and I'm going to do some more transcribing soon. Um, it's called Walter and Ina. Uh, my grandfather was Walter. My grandmother was Ina. Um, and this is, uh, you can find it at walterandina.com. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's what the blog tagline says. It's a story of love, war, and science. Um, and right now, Amazing. the Amazing. the post that, ju that I just uh, had come up today um, is the first letter that he wrote to her right after they met. And uh, he's asking for a date. <clears throat> um, and, and, and now, you know, this is 1924 at this point, and, and these are two properly raised Southerners, so there are no improprieties here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, uh, but the next, uh, coming up in the next letters, which will be starting Monday, um, he's going to start telling his girlfriend about his work. And he is a scientific assistant with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He's an entomologist. Um, and he has just been, um, nice. you're, you're going to see in the letters this, uh, uh, he's going to start mentioning that he has been asked to go to Jacksonville, Florida. He's currently based in Dallas in 1924. Um, he's been asked to go to Jacksonville to investigate a, uh, a strange tropical disease that's been breaking out there the past <laughs> couple of summers. Um, and uh, they wouldn't normally call the USDA for that, but uh, they think that it may be caused by an insect. So they're calling him in as an entomologist cool. to cool figure out stuff. what's causing it. So you'll get to follow. And, and I, in looking through the letters, he, he describes the science as it's happening and, and describes, you know, some of the false nice. leads and the frustrations and um, the procedures that he's using um, and you'll also see, and this ends up being clinical research, um, old school style. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, there, there are oh, no yeah. IRBs or anything like that. This is, uh, <laughs> this is just being done. Um, you know, so Rich you'll... lives right in the heart of the application of that, by the way. Okay. Yeah, the screw so I yeah, do. the screw fly. That's sure. right. Exactly. Ah, right. Oh okay. yeah, the thing. That, right, the thing that he's working on at the outset is the screw worm fly. Um, and that's exactly. going to be that's going to be a running theme um, consistently because that still hasn't been solved in the 1920s. And uh, but he's been called away to do this other tropical disease thing, and you're going to learn about that, and then you'll learn more about um, some other stuff that he does later on too. Alan, this Alan, is really this is great, fabulous. Alan. I don't, I don't really stuff. need it. I don't really need another blog to read, but uh, <laughs> I started reading this uh, this afternoon, and it is really terrific. It's really nice. Thank well, you for and doing I, that, it'll Alan. only be one post a day, so you don't have to commit a lot of time to it. <laughs> All right. Alan, uh, thank you so much for that, and thanks for joining us. I know you have to leave, so we'll say yep. goodbye. Alan is at alandove.com and also at walterandina.com. Thanks a lot, Alan. Thanks, All right. Alan. Thank you. Always a pleasure. See you, Alan. Take, Take it easy, care. Alan. Rich, what do you have for us? I have a pic that was sent to me by a student, Bridget. And uh, it is a recording from the Laboratory of Applied Bioacoustics at the, a, it's the uh, University in Barcelona, a, a, bio, a Barcelona tech. Uh, there's a, an outfit called, uh, let me get it here, called uh, Lido, Listening to the Deep Ocean Environment. This is a project of this guy at Barcelona Tech, where they're recording undersea sounds from all over the world, really, uh, for a variety of purposes, but they caught the earthquake. Right. So if you go to this, um, you can see the earthquake, and it's uh, pretty uh, astounding. Um, uh, I if there's a spectrogram that goes with, I've got it going through my headphones now, it's driving me crazy. Um, there's a spectrogram that goes along with it and it shows the earthquake and it's uh, uh, pretty amazing. So Knocked the planet off its axis. It's yeah. amazing. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, it slowed time down. It, it changed the time of the year. Right. That's it's great, bizarre. Rich. Thank you, Rich. Uh, my pick is... A light fixture from Restoration Hardware. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of this company. It's a wonderful I hear. company. And right. this is called in the catalog a steel polyhedron pendant, but in fact, <laughs> it is a virus with a light bulb uh, inside of it. You can get it in three different sizes. <laughs> it is a icosahedral virus. Look at it. It is gorgeous. And the moment I saw it, it was sent to me by a former student, Eric Moss. Thank you, Eric. 
and I want one. <laughs> I want one too. Oh, this yeah. is great. We're, we're remodeling the kitchen, and we need a new cool. chandelier in the breakfast room. I oh, wonder if my wife that. will go for this. Go for it. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not exactly right. <laughs> well, I'll show it to her. See what I can. You know, she's done the whole project, right? And I've just kind of been an observer. I haven't oh, made no. any contributions at all so far. And this was so, this is perfect. Yes. <laughs> well, that'll do it for. Another TWIV, guys, as always, send us your questions and comments to TWIV at TWIV.TV. You can find us on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace. We also have an app at microbeworld.org where you can stream TWIV to your iPhone or Android device. Check it out at microbeworld.org. Hey, Mark, can I thank everyone or would you like to do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Let's, let's well, first go, of, for it. go for it. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Mark. For having us on Futures in Biotech. Sure, you bet. I, I second that one. You know, this was a show that terms like thrombo, cytopenia, squirrel monkey retrovirus, <laughs> and screwworm fly were used. <laughs> Thank you. And it was an honor to have you on, the, have you on our network as well. So this is it's great. great. Now, it's always a pleasure. We, uh, we get a lot of fans back and forth. I know that. And uh, That's true. I really appreciate whenever we can come on. I think it was great to show the whole crew. And the crew is Dixon de Pommier. Thank you, Dixon. Advanced. Dixon's at verticalfarm.com. And always good to see and you. Trichinella.org. And trichinella.org. And trichinella.org. And while we're at it, medicalecology.com. Right. <laughs> there you go. Alan Dove, of course, is at alandove.com. Rich Condit, thank you so much. You're quite welcome. This is great. And, uh, and thank you. And thanks, Mark. This has been good fun. Rich is at the University of Florida, Gainesville, home of the Gators. How did they do, Rich? Did you follow that one at all or not? <laughs> uh, no, I've not been following the basketball. Uh, I, okay. got, I need to go to a couple of baseball games because they're doing really well. <laughs> oh, they're good. Yep. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.